Today on the show, we have a combination of a data scientist, an elite level coach, and a former elite level athlete, all with unique skill sets that are helping to build a new agile human performance company worldwide. This is a smart triune of people that I was able to learn a tremendous amount from earlier this year while serving on a panel of coaches to get up to speed on this new training tool. And now I want to share all of this knowledge they have with you, our listeners. Before we get into the meat of that knowledge, let's first start with a bit more of who our guests are today. Fede, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, sure. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, I'm Fede, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk here and share uh, what we are doing in, in, in Super Sapiens to, to bridge a CGM into athletes' uh, perspective or within their tool uh, to optimize their performance. Uh, so I'm um, the VP of Science in Super Sapiens. I'm with the company since the beginning of, of the journey. Um, my background is mainly uh, in um, sports science and exercise physiology. Uh, so I've been doing uh, research in the last 10 years uh, on uh, human performance, especially during endurance activities. Uh, and now what I'm, I'm doing here is um, investigating how we can use uh, the super sapiens uh, biosensor within uh, the athletic context to uh, perhaps optimize their performance uh, on a daily basis. And I mean, my journey is a combination of uh, uh, investigating uh, what is available from an evidence perspective. So what we know uh, from the science behind glucose, how athletes are using it, and how we can um, investigate uh, the field with experiments to bridge new knowledge into our kind of context. Awesome. Yeah. And as you, as you all can, can hear, we're going to, we're going to be learning a lot from, uh, Fede as well as the other two guests, uh, today. So, uh, Bobby, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Yes. My name is Bobby Julik. I was a, um, professional cyclist for 16 years, moved into the, the coaching aspect of things. And, and recently, um, about nine months ago, maybe 10 months ago, got exposed to the Super Sapiens platform during uh, the pandemic when there wasn't much going on. And myself and another sports science buddy were just kind of having those virtual cocktail hours and kind of talking about new and emerging tech. And this kind of came on our radar. And it's funny um, that both of us are, are now actually working for the company. Um, you know, coaching was a big part of my life and always will be. And I always feel that there's no such thing as a bad coach because that person is actually sacrificing their time for someone else. But you know, you, you have to think outside the box sometimes. And this is definitely thinking out of the box. I mean, I don't have any um, fancy abbreviations or letters after my name. Um, I went straight from, you know, straight into the professional sports, straight into coaching. So I'm learning something every every day. And that's what I love about this platform is one and one doesn't always equal two. And you're not the same person today that you were a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. So having this insight um, into your blood glucose levels has been just a mind blow for me. So um, I'm, I'm absolutely proud to be associated with this company, but also um, not hesitant at all to say that I am not an expert in any way, shape or form, but I am just all ears and 100% behind what we're doing here. Yeah. Bobby, you are an expert in taking oh, the science and that application side and in, in delivering it to the athlete. So, um, I just, I wanted listeners to, to know that well-established coach and a good friend over many years. And then, uh, Brad, Tell us more about you. Uh, my name is Brad Huff. Uh, I'm lucky enough that my entire kind of career was focused on cycling. I was able to be a professional cyclist for 13 years, and my education was around that. I was able to get a nutrition degree. I was able to actually work at Carmichael Training Systems for a small period of time and um, really build my knowledge towards my goal of becoming a professional cyclist. And I'm really lucky that over those 13 years as a professional, I got to work with incredible people. Um, at CTS um, with Alan Lim, you know, to just build the knowledge that I have. And I'm able to carry that now into Super Sapiens um, through the direct experience that I learned on every detail of my life. Because 
as an athlete, I wasn't born with a giant VO2. And, uh, you know, I wasn't a Tour de France level athlete as Bobby Julek here. So, you know, I had to do every little thing to get there. And um, that has really enabled me to have more experience and more ideas of the real world athlete and what they go through. And here at Super Sapiens, learning every bit of lifestyle, of stress, um, every, um, you know, implement that you put into life to have optimization is affecting your glucose. And so that's really an incredible way that I'm able to share that. That's great. That's great. And for our listeners, I mean, you can tell there's, there's a lot of, a lot of robust knowledge going on here. And again, thank you to you all for taking time out of your, your busy schedule. You guys just came off a huge, um, uh, company wide meeting to, to join us here. And the final thing is this is my first time I've ever interviewed three people at once. So we'll see how much we have to edit, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll cover all the good stuff and, and, uh, get people learning along the way. So, to start things off, I'll, I'll turn to you, Bobby. Can you tell us more about what Super Sapiens is? How, to, how did it start and the overall vision of the company? Yeah, Super Sapiens is a continuous glucose monitoring device. Um, Paul, uh, I'm sorry, Phil Sutherland, our, our CEO and founder, um, he was a type one diabetic from seven years, uh, seven months old. And, you know, this, this, this has been part of his life for a long time. Um, I'm not diabetic, so I never really thought about blood glucose levels and the importance of that. But, um, you know, Phil started the team, Team Type 1, uh, that is now Team Novo Nordisk. And um, very recently, in the last year or so, two years, he said, hey, you know, why, why is this technology only used for people living with diabetes? Wouldn't this be transferable to people uh, in endurance sports and overall health and fitness. And the company has started. And yes, we are a startup. Um, there's no doubt about that. We have an incredible team of people. And basically what we're just doing is trying to empower activity. And everyone is an individual. We know that. Once you get one of these sensors on, you realize that something that you eat may spike you and your buddy may eat the same thing and it won't spike him. So it's, it's very individualized. And I think that's so key because as an athlete, as a coach for so long, we had these fueling protocols. And now, you know, it, when you look back, they're, they're very, very close, but there are always those people, those, those outliers outside of the bell curve that may not respond to the same nutrition that we have historically, unfortunately, um, kind of copy and pasted throughout the years. So this just gives a really good insight into your body's metabolism and, you know, really keeps track of glucose, which is, you know, we can say a lot of things, but glucose equals energy in the, in the short, short of it. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up. That's a great overview and kind of segues into my next question for Fede. Can you tell us more about blood glucose, how a CGM works and overall, why, why our listeners should want to know about this? Yeah, sure. So CGM is uh, basically a, a sensor. Um, so it's a piece of, it's a device that do measure uh, interstitial glucose concentration uh, through a filament that is inserted under the skin. And it does sense the amount of sugar that, it, that is circulating uh, within this liquid that is called uh, interstitial liquid, interstitial fluid, that basically surrounds every cell of the human body. Uh, why there? Why do we measure it there? Because it's a very convenient location. Uh, and also because we know that it's the, the medium through which glucose has to move from the blood to uh, the, the cell of the active muscles, but also over the brain, over the pancreas, or so wherever in the, in, um, in, in the body. Uh, we do measure it um, over, over the, the arm. So the, our, our application is on the arm. Uh, the sensor sticks on the skin for 14 days. That's the lifespan of the sensor. And it sent uh, the glucose concentration uh, over, um, it transmit a signal to a, to a phone, to an application, the Super Sapiens app. Um, it measures glucose every minute, so you have a minute by minute uh, acquisition frequency uh, over the lifespan of the sensor, so 14 days. Um, the sensor works through an enzymatic process. It basically converts 
the amount of sugar in, in the liquid um, into uh, an electric signal. The higher the signal, the higher the concentration of sugar in the fluid. So that's the basic principle behind it. So the technology is in place since 20 years. I think one of the first CGM has been developed in 1999 uh, when it becomes uh, kind of um, a very wide used in the monitoring of uh, diabetes. Uh, so we have around 20 years of experience down to, um, to the sensor itself and how to, how to use it, how to improve it. And over time, the sensor went through a lot of uh, studies down to um, application, reliability, validity, accuracy, but also technical improvement like uh, the hardware. So now we have very light sensor, very small sensors, while previously sensors were like the size of a bag. So now you can you cannot even feel it when it's on when it's on when it's applied on 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 your arm. Um, also down to uh, accuracy in reading and also delay uh, between what we kind of sense in the blood and what we sense in the interstitial fluid. New algorithms now make the the readings much more reliable and much more precise. Um, so over time we had this chance to test it out, and now what we can do is to to, to, to use it with confidentially uh, within a different context since the sensors were developed in the space of uh, diabetes management. But uh, the sensor that we do um, use now in Super Sapiens is a sport device, is not a medical device, and is not intended for people need to manage diabetes, is intended for uh, the athletic population. So people that are active and would like to optimize their performance down to controlling and visualize uh, glucose uh, within the body. Yeah, that's that's good. I would not want a giant bag strapped to my arm when I'm trying to ride my bike. So I'm glad I'm glad things have evolved. Um, you, you covered basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you from a technological perspective, uh, thanks to these uh, devices, our capacity to investigate the internal uh, milieu of the human body has advanced dramatically. Uh, so we will have more knowledge in the future, more analytes in the future. But thanks to this uh, device, we will advance a lot what we know uh, behind how the body works during exercise. Gotcha. So for, for our listeners who don't really know anything about blood glucose, um, could you just go like overview high level of maybe what a bl blood glucose trend or maybe a number is while we're just at rest? versus training and maybe what intensity or general stress would do to your blood glucose? So usually, um, I mean, glucose is always present in the circulation because it's vital uh, for the body to maintain uh, energy kind of control and production. Uh, and the majority of the tissues and cells can use glucose for uh, surviving. Some cells can only use glucose for survival. So that's why it's so important as a, as a nutrient within our body. What type, um, of, what type of cells, if you don't mind me interrupting, what type of cells only use glucose for fuel? For example, uh, brain metabolism yep. uh, do rely only on glucose. Uh, also, red blood cells, uh, they do rely on glucose. Um, and also, if you consider uh, within the exercise context, uh, above a certain intensity, uh, we know that the only um, available molecule to produce energy that quick is uh, glucose. So it becomes essential above a certain uh, exercise intensity. That It's a bit individual, that threshold, and we know it as the common anaerobic threshold or respiratory compensation point. But this is why it becomes uh, so important from the uh, kind of energy management perspective. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, normally on average, uh, people, I mean, glucose is sit around, uh, around 100 milligrams per deciliter or between 90 and 105. That's a bit subjective, but there is quite a degree of variability between individuals. So if you monitor your glucose level over 24 hours, you will probably see that your average is within this range. So between 85 and 105. Um, why? Uh, well, because the body uh, has a lot of counter-regulatory mechanisms to keep 
your glucose within this range. Uh, because we know that uh, kind of going below or going above the range will have some consequences. As we see, for example, in diabetes, where you lose some of these counter-regulatory mechanisms and your body is not capable anymore to keep your blood glucose within this range. However, I mean, since uh, some years ago, we thought that uh, glucose in a, in, a, in, a, in a person without diabetes was almost a flat line uh, over time. But when you start measuring uh, glucose minute by minute, you do see that glucose do fluctuate quite a lot uh, over your day. So it's not really true that it's a flat line, but it has also massive excursions um, in, in, in active people. So we now have athletes that are able to maintain very high level of glucose for quite a lot of time during exercise or spiking to 200 uh, or down to 50, 55 is quite uh, common. Um, it is not, uh, it's not dangerous, it's not a problem. So our body is capable of controlling it. Uh, but over time, if you keep exposing your body to high degrees of fluctuation or high numbers or low numbers, you might end up developing some metabolic consequences. And this is one of the reasons why you, you will like to control it and to learn how your body is normally behaving down to uh, or after a meal or during exercise or over your recovery phase overnight just to kind of develop a fingerprint of who you are from a metabolic perspective and, and, and see if you can benefit from optimizing it yeah so i mean this is this is that window into the body to have more awareness about how your body is actually functioning right yeah, that's correct. That's correct. And we do have, uh, uh, you do see a lot of uh, subjectivity. So people do control glucose homeostasis in different ways, just because um, even though homeostasis is kind of a, a whole and, 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 and common uh, set of mechanisms within the body, within a person, a healthy person, I would say, then people do control glucose homeostasis slightly different uh, because that it's down to a lot of factors um, that affect glucose in the circulation. Also, uh, your capacity to, click, to quickly control for it, it's, uh, it's individual. Um, the degrees of fluctuation over time is individual. So yeah, there is a lot of subjectivity. This is also why having visibility uh, is almost mandatory if you want to learn how your body, how your unique body is controlling it. Oh. Yeah. And you're saying visibility into what that blood glucose number is. That's the visibility that you're talking about, right, Fede? Yeah, that, that's correct. Even though if we, I mean, we do not refer to it as blood glucose because it, it's not correct, is interstitial glucose um, because it's just a different compartment, even if they do kind of goes together, uh, especially when the situation is stable. So away from foods and, and meals. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's visibility down to your glucose level. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, no, good. Thank you for that overview, Fede. That's super helpful. And I, and I think our listeners are starting to get a better understanding of what blood glucose monitoring can, can look like. Um, Brad, I'm going to turn to you for this, these next set of questions and we'll, we'll frame it up to where it, we talked a lot about this in, in our three months of super sapiens college, if you will. Um, and it's also available on the website, but you know, super sapiens and, and you guys there call it the system prime perform recover. Can you speak to how you would use that system or how an athlete that you've been working with out in the field uses that general concept to help them perform better in their sport or live better in life or um, become more aware of how they interact with food? A big thing for athletes is they only think about the activity. You know, a lot of when we, when we started, we were just focused on high intensity activities, the perform aspect of it. But through research, through the understanding of the data we've collected with, you know, athletes from the Olympic gold medalist level to someone running a 5k or a marathon, that it's, it's your daily life that really impacts what, how your glucose will respond in an activity. So in that priming state is understanding, you know, those, those parameters that we've known through textbooks of, you know, four hours before you're supposed to have 
you know, um, six grams per, per kilogram of, of carbohydrate intake, you know, or, or whatever number that you find is best for you. We're actually seeing that it is very individualized. You know, someone that thinks they're eating the perfect meal, um, one hour, one hour before they head out the door is actually impairing the way that their glucose will respond in activity, which will limit the availability of glucose in a high, high intensity activity. And so as we blend the prime, perform, and recover, each athlete is able to really do a trial and error of their favorite meals, their pre-ride meal, or their just general diet that they, they take in. And is, is that causing extreme variability too close to a workout, um, leaving more circulating insulin um, in, their, in their bloodstream, causing a drop in blood glucose in the perform state or in the activity of their, of their choosing? Um, so they have heavier legs. They have a little bit of more mental mental frustration of getting through the workout or getting through the warm up, And, you know, a lot of us have known in cycling or in any type of activity that, man, it just takes me 20 minutes to really get moving or 30 minutes to just get my legs back underneath me. And we're kind of seeing that's really affected by the priming or the time before the nutrition before an activity. Um, and then in recovery, ensuring that you are allowing yourself to go through the natural response of glucose after you eat, you know, you have your recovery shake, you know, your two to one, your three to one, four to one um, protein to recovery, however you choose, you feel is best for you. Knowing that that's a, that's a response that's naturally been happening in our bodies for, you know, since we were, you know, evolved. And now we have this window into the body and a lot of athletes are saying, oh my gosh, my, my glucose is going to 200 after I worked out doing my recovery shake. Is this good? It's like, actually, yes, this is part of the process, part of getting you, you resynthesize, having more glycogen replenishment in the body so that you're preparing for the next day. So every day in this athlete, the prime perform and recover is, is ever evolving. And as, as Bobby was saying that every day is a little different and we're able to pull in, was there a life stress? Did you have impaired sleep? You know, was there things that were taking your, your thought pattern off of what am I going to eat later in the day? And you're making poor choices and you can see how that affects the next day's workout or that workout that you're in. And so we're really evolving. We're actually understanding more of each athlete and, um, we really ask each athlete to take time to learn their body, you know, give themselves time. Don't feel like you're going to be perfect right out of the box because even Fede with his years of, of research underneath him and use case with Novo Nordis is still evolving and learning each day and helping another athlete kind of understand why this, this specific food impacted them negatively or positively. And so it is really an enjoyable process to help each person get more out of every day and that prime perform and recover. Oh, that's, that's awesome. A really good recap on that. And that, that prime is, um, like topping off the tank before a training session, how far in advance, like what's a timeline on that, Brad? Well, um, it goes out from the night before, um, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of athletes kind of wake up early and they do, they do workouts and we're seeing that, you know, a lot of athletes, Oh, I have a glass of orange juice or I have a bagel right before I head out the door to do this ride. And they're actually kind of shooting themselves in the foot on a glucose response um, in the activity. We're finding that, you know, sometimes athletes are better to actually go in fasted and then start fueling in the warm up, and they'll have a better glucose response. They'll have better, better feeling in their legs, better, better mental acuity. You know, they'll be able to complete the workout with, with a better kind of overall feeling and glucose response and completing the goal of the workout, even if it's a 30 minute run or a two hour session, smash session with your buddies. So in that priming, it's always different, you know, because it's the timing of people getting out the door is always different. And so we're enabling athletes to start thinking about the 24 hour period or the two day period or three day period leading into this goal workout or just consistent training. Yeah. So, so it's a, a longer time scale of priming in addition to breakfast or the, the, the exactly. meal beforehand. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, and then performance. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sure Fede has the, has the grams per kilogram like memorized in his head and he could give some of that actually. Oh, I've, I've got Fede queued up for some grams per kilogram here in, in a bit. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah, he'll, yeah. he'll have to be on the edge of his seat until then. Um, <laughs> the, the perform, but that's just, that is warm up to cool down and, and that's it. Is that what we're talking about? And in all the good stuff in between, that's what you're talking about for the perform. Yes. Yeah. You know, a lot of athletes kind of negate, negate the warm up, and that can actually impact how your glucose response is, um, in the activity. 
you know, causing, causing too much of a stress um, in that initial, initial period, not allowing the, the cells to kind of like, or the body to warm up properly and release glucose in a, in a fluid manner. They can see a drop um, if they don't allow that because it, you can go into more of an anaerobic state um, quicker. Um, and so, wait, 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 go ahead. wait, wait, you're saying don't sprint out of the parking lot. Well, you know, sometimes you're late and you got to catch up. Um, so maybe some breathing exercises in the car when you're driving to meet your buddies might help that fight or flight response as you're getting there. So, um, but yeah, warm up is, uh, always preferred. <laughs> uh, and then the recover, I mean, th this is, uh, this recovery window we've talked about for years. Um, when is this window, Brad? Is it like, as soon as you clip out, is it an hour afterwards? When is that recovery time period? Well, uh, the sooner, the better for sure. Uh, you know, but it depends on the, the, the length of the workout, the intensity of the workout, you know, if you're doing a one hour smash session, um, and you don't have a training, you know, a hard training ride for a couple of days, well, you can, you can kind of like get home, get, take a shower, you know, get cleaned up, get dressed. And then, you know, maybe have your recovery shake or a sandwich as you run out the door an hour later, you know, and you'll still have benefits of that. Um, so the recovery period, yes, you want to get the grams of carbohydrates back in the body protein in there to help with, with kind of the overall replenishment of glycogen stores for the next workout. But as every athlete, we're telling them like, well, it just depends on your life. What's going on. Like if you can do the recovery shake, yeah, do it. You're going to feel better. You're going to have better glucose response throughout the rest of the day. Um, less stress hormones created. And, um, uh, yeah, the recovery is always individualized. Um, you know, I prefer, you know, I'd love to have peanut butter and banana, uh, instead of always going to like your typical, like recovery shake that you're shaking up in the, you know, in the blender. So, um, Gotcha. Okay. So prime perform recover, um, good, good extrapolation of what that is. I'm, I'm reminded of a, of a priming story that Bobby shared on, on one of our super sapiens calls and it kind of speaks to that individuality or the individualness of, uh, leading up to a training session, Bobby, it, it was something like you had a normal breakfast and you're getting these low blood glucose responses and you switch to something else. Can you, can you give a, an, us an example of that or what that story was? Um, I believe the one that I, I, I told you about was just the different um, timing of what I was eating before I was doing the exact same effort. So the first time I kind of was a little bit uh, late, um, had eaten earlier, but was not really primed to perfection and um, maybe started overfueling too, too early and actually had just as bad uh, sensations being almost like hyperglycemic compared to being hypoglycemic. Right. And then um, because remember, I want to go back to that warm up, uh, warm up in the past, the way that I looked at it, we kind of looked at it as cardiovascular warm up and uh, muscular warm up, but now there's the metabolic warm up. So like, like you said, sprinting out of the parking lot, was it your cardio? Was it your muscular or was it your, you, you just didn't have the glycolytic system clicking over quite yet. Okay. So when, when you're, when you're going to do that interval uh, or that test that, that I shared with you guys at super sapiens university um, you know, I don't really think I was, really metabolically warmed up before I tried that effort. And then, you know, maybe overfueled and, and the, the sensations weren't the best, but like, that's, that's what it is now. It's almost a totally new way of thinking about, am I ready for this hard workout? Because like when you're just rolling with your buddies or going to a weekend ride, you're just going downhill the whole time, you know, and then you start with your friends and, you know, the pace kicks up. That's kind of like a warm up and you're already thinking about fueling and stuff. But like thinking about um, like a time trial, the reason why we give uh, athletes such a regimented warm up schedule um, really, you know, myself, at least admittedly, not really knowing what that was about as far as from the metabolic standpoint. But like you always wonder when you, you want to be, as soon as you take that first pedal stroke off the, the time trial ramp or off the start line, you want to be ready to go. But so often we feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not there yet. You know, and you takes a couple minutes to warm up, but that's all time that you've lost. So, you know, for me, getting, getting that fueling correct and 
um, doing these little tests because like we said, everyone is individualized. And if you're going out for a world's best, like we have some Olympic champions, or if it's a personal best, or if it's a daily best, you want to kind of give yourself the best opportunity to succeed, to succeed in whatever workout that is. Got it. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And it makes me also want to go a little deeper into that, that priming, um, portion of what super sapiens talked about. And I'll turn to Fede for this one, uh, just for some specifics of priming the tank in particular, getting your body to, to store glycogen for, um, an energy source later on. Can you talk about the, the on hours and off hours targeting of blood glucose that the super sapiens app helps you to identify for yourself and, and how that works with actually perhaps storing glycogen into the body and, and where the glycogen is actually stored? So, sure. Um, so we know that glycogen is the, is the only form or is the only storage of glucose uh, within the body. We have around half a kilo of glycogen uh, stored in our muscle and around 100 to 200 grams of glycogen stored within our liver. Plus, we have some circulating glucose in the in the in the blood that will be around uh, four to five grams. Um, so, uh, and since glucose is a finite uh, amount uh, of um, uh, of molecules within the body, uh, we need to replenish it. Um, we also know that um, depleting glycogen levels is one of the major um, kind of factor related to fatigue development, simply because glycogen is uh, very uh, efficient in terms of energy production capability, but also in terms of energy rate production. So when you produce energy from glycogen, your body can produce it very, very quickly. So that's why you need to keep replenishing glycogen. And that's also why reducing your glycogen levels will uh, induce fatigue development. However, and this is what is really interesting down to uh, managing uh, glucose concentration uh, within the blood or the interstitial, the, the interstitial fluid, is that we now know that after a certain um, amount of uh, exercise, like duration, the body will rely more and more on uh, glucose coming from the blood. For producing energy uh, why even if you feed with uh, exogenous carbohydrate why simply because your muscle glycogen stores during exercise will get depleted even if you feed with carbohydrate and that's the point where your body needs to switch um, on, on glucose that coming from the circulation to sustain energy production in the muscle and from available studies we know that for example uh, at the beginning of exercise, your glucose coming from the blood will produce um, a very small portion of the energy expenditure. But on the contrary, after uh, 90 minutes of exercise, everything you that is circulating in the system is going to be oxi oxidized in the muscle for energy production. So after roughly two hours of exercise, uh, glucose coming from the circulation is um, kind of contributing up to 60% of the energy production uh, in the muscle. So it becomes more and more important as exercise progress and as intensity uh, will increase. Um, and back to your question down to, uh, to glycogen. I mean, um, we know that uh, through carbohydrate feeding, one can um, kind of level up their glycogen stores um, after 48 hours of consistent carbohydrate intake. Uh, from studies, we know that if you intake around between 8 to 10 grams per kilogram of body weight uh, of carbohydrate over this uh, time period, you will pretty sure that your glycogen stores will be full. And we also know that after um, an overnight uh, fasted period, in a couple of hours of moderate intensity exercise, your glycogen stores will be empty. So this is where you will need to pay more and more attention to controlling glucose coming from the circulation. And this is where it becomes more and more uh, relevant during exercise. Um, and, and down to priming, I mean, we, we do know it, it's, still, it's still difficult to relate uh, what is happening in the circulation to your glycogen levels. We don't have enough knowledge in that direction. 
we are working with some institutions like some universities to better understand what is the uh, association within a laboratory condition between your glucose level and your glycogen stores and what is the trigger for fatigue develop development and whether you can perhaps use glucose levels as a proxy of glycogen stores but this is where the product is getting very very interesting because most of the time when we talk about glucose we don't have enough knowledge um in in, in outside of the diabetic diabetic context and this is where we need to develop the knowledge that we don't have if you for example start to learn something behind heart rate and heart rate monitoring uh, during activities you, you have a lot of material to read we have more than 100 years of research to base our learning and our assumption uh, on on the contrary down to glucose metabolism uh, we know that the, the basics so from a physiological perspective we know what what glucose is, what the role of glucose during exercise, before exercise, after exercise. But we don't know a lot about how the body controls it in the circulation and what is the relationship between uh, performance, uh, fatigue, uh, uh, attention or focus in your uh, kind of circulating glucose level. This is where we are playing or trying to play a big role in understanding from the data we get on a daily basis from our athletes talking with our athletes, uh, keep, keep searching for available literature that might be dig under a lot of uh, years, uh, but also working with universities to develop new knowledge. Um, we did open uh, several partnerships with institutions across the globe to investigate in control condition what exactly is the role of glucose levels during different activities. Yeah, oh, that's, that's exciting. Um, that's, uh, I'll be super keen to hear how that goes. Y you threw out some numbers for priming the eight to 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight, um, 24 to 48 hours before to make sure all the glycogen should be replenishing going on. Um, and if you take some of that in conjunction with what Brad and Bobby were saying with, um, knowing how this, this food, this carbohydrate interacts with your body to be sure not to super spike too high or spike or drop below super sapiens calls that the off hours targeting, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So during the perform time period, um, this is where you want higher blood glucose levels to occur. And in order to get there, I, I liken it to, um, a, a time in zone for power or heart rate, and you can get visibility or to see what that blood glucose number is while you're training. Uh, how do, how can an athlete get their blood glucose up into that time and zone for the on hours and what would be a typical recommended dosage of carbohydrate for that fitting? Yeah, always consider that um, the relevance of uh, glucose, uh, circulating glucose to enhancing performance is down to duration and intensity, but also your intake before the exercise. So considering these three factors is very important to contextualize why you need to control uh, glucose levels during exercise. And we also need to keep in mind that uh, concentration drives uh, utilization of glucose. So the higher your glucose concentration during exercise, the higher it will be the glucose uptake within the cells. Um, so, and, and this is where the concept of your uh, glucose performance zone actually um, was born, because what you should do is trying to increase your glucose level to ensure a proper availability of glucose and to drive uptake in the muscle. But at the moment, we don't have enough knowledge down to a, a certain threshold. So this is where people need to experiment. And this is where we are starting to investigate whether exists uh, an individual specific glucose threshold that will promote a better feeling and a better performance. Uh, but nevertheless, we know that one of the main aim for an athlete would be to increase the, the circulating glucose level, uh, at least to maintain glucose flux to the muscle and glucose uptake into the muscle. Especially as I was uh, saying before, after one to one and a half hour of moderate to high intensity exercises. And historically, um, we, we know that 
I mean, we, we thought that the maximal amount of glucose that one can intake would be around 60 grams per hour. Uh, but now, thanks to uh, science development, we know that you can actually increase more by combining different molecules, like glucose with fructose, for example. And we also have some um, empirical evidences down to very high intake of glucose, above 100 grams um, per minute. Um, and this is where uh, a question arises uh, on which, I mean, is it all oxidized? So is it all about increasing absorption? Uh, how can you make sure that everything you do digest will be oxidized in the muscle? And this is where it gets very difficult to uh, to measure because it requires a lab control environment. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, we know that at very high intensity of exercise, uh, your body is or can be able to metabolize up to uh, five grams per minute of carbohydrate. And that's a lot. It's almost, it's above 200 grams per hour. And this is something you will never be capable of ingesting. Uh, but the more you ingest, the less you will rely on your glycogen stores that you need to prevent over time. So, and this is where athletes, but also companies and sport uh, kind of supplements company are, are uh, developing uh, studies on how to increase our capacity to ingest carbohydrate. Uh, and, and there are some very interesting emerging concepts behind our capacity to train our system to digest, absorb, transport, and utilize carbohydrates. Uh, and Asker Yukendrup was one of the, um, the, pioneer, the pioneer people behind the concept. So you are, you are, your body is, is uh, adaptable. So you can really train your system to, um, to digest more, to absorb more uh, by a progressive uh, intake. So by actually a training, um, a training process of increasing your capacity to process and, uh, and absorb carbohydrate. Uh, but the yeah, standard recommendations are still between 60 and 90 uh, grams per hour to avoid um, gastrointestinal um, discomfort or, or downside symptoms. Gotcha, gotcha. Bobby, I'll turn to you for, for this one. Um, with you know, being an elite athlete, going to the coaching side and now being on this uh, human performance uh, team, has all of this changed anything that you're doing in, in coaching your athletes from a, a fueling or, or a prescription of training side of things, or did it not change and just validate what you do? T tell us more about how you actually use this. Okay. Let me say, first of all, you know, the protocol that we've used, you know, in the world tour for a long time is, is very, very close, but my, my struggle as I think, if you're a coached athlete or a self-coached athlete, um, you want to succeed. So what happens? You know, you, you build the motor, you know, and then you put on, you know, fancy wheels and, you know, nice new paint job. And then as a coach on race day, you throw those keys to the athlete or to the director sportive and just hope that you don't, you know, that it comes back in one piece. So you, you built that motor, you've done everything that you could. And then on, on race day, you have to trust the athlete. And when they succeed, it's like, hey, everything worked right. That, that was fantastic. But when they don't succeed, um, a lot of the times it's like, hey, I wasn't fit enough or this or that. And so often for me, my first question to that athlete is, how did you fuel during the effort? I fueled fine. I fueled fine. I couldn't eat anymore. I couldn't drink anymore. And you have to take their word for it. So then you question and you go back to the training and, you know, cause that's something that you can control. And you're like, wait a second. No, like this was right. And now with this device, um, it takes that out of it because you can actually see, Hey, you know, were you fueled correctly in, in, in definite terms rather than just, you know, the opinion. Because we all know once we get into competition, um, our thought process some sometimes goes out the window. We start to focus on other things. Before we know it, an hour has passed, and we were supposed to be hitting our fueling strategy, and we forgot to do that because the intensity was too high or the stress was too high. And now it's you can actually show them, listen, this is where you were before you kind of um, forgot to fuel, and this is where you were towards the end. So... Listen, we can't change that result, but we can make that 
we can make those little tweaks to our fueling strategy or prioritize our fueling strategy strategy regardless of you know the 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 conditions of the race or the stress of the race so for me it is really changed a lot because confidence in an athlete is everything and you know they put in all the hard work you know as a coach it's easy you just prescribe but the athletes have to go out there and and do it and when they're fueled right they enjoy it more they succeed and that just cast, that just becomes just a an upward trend of positive things that are going to happen when they go out regardless if they're fit or not fit enough to do the effort that you prescribe for them maybe sometimes thousands of miles away um, and they're not fueled and they fail then it's just a cascading problem that's going to affect the relationship uh, the confidence in the athlete, first and foremost, the relationship of the coach, and ultimately the overall enjoyment of the of the sport. So fueling has become my obsession. Um, I think everyone that, that is exposed to this technology will realize that there are a lot of improvements to be made. You, you know, marginal gains has been a word for over a decade now that people have been used, you know, with different wheels or different clothing or this and that. This isn't a marginal gain. This is a semi-maximum gain for most people. Um, for pro, pro uh, world tour athletes, maybe not because they've been kind of taught these protocols over time. But for the the weekend warrior, for the amateur athlete, I think they're really going to benefit from the insight and knowledge that they learn themselves or have a coach help them through. And that to me is, is the beauty of this is we're just trying to make each individual athlete a better version of themselves from a fueling standpoint. And, you know, that every, we, we say this quite often, uh, every person with a goal is an athlete. So if your goal is to win the Tour de France, the goal is to, you know, finish your weekend ride, or your goal is just to do better than you did before on, on Zwift or Peloton. Fueling is so often that variable that we forget about. So to me, th that's, that's where it's at. That's, that's, that's my passion. And that's the focus, um, even j just as much as the training intensity and duration is the, the proper fueling, um, you know, during on and off hours. Yeah. You touched on some really good stuff there. And to expand on it, you know, you said coaches prescribe and we definitely do. I, th I think that we kind of, as a collective group of coaches, we, we can really, um, get hung up on prescribing, prescribing, prescribing without realizing you first analyze, then prescribe properly. Right. And then you refine and we can do that with power meters and heart rate monitors. And then if you're there with the athlete to see how they execute, um, at the certain portions of the race or throughout the, the duration of the race that helps in the refining process. But, and, and remember you, you mentioned, uh, power meters, Yeah, power meters, when they first came out, it was basically like a fancy speedometer. No right. one really knew how to Not use it. And it took a long time for us coaches um, to, to learn the little nuances there, the, the little unlocks. And that's, that's what we also have to be aware of with Super Sapiens is that it's a ultra marathon. It's not a sprint. You're not going to figure out every single finite detail in the first week. And I know that goes against what a lot of athletes want is like, give it to me now. Tell me my number. I'll stay there. But, you know, that's... That's this new kind of phase of coaching is explaining uh, this very important uh, skill. I mean, it is a skill and you need to learn just like you learned how to use the heart rate monitor, just how you learned how to use the, the whoop, the aura, the power meter. You need to learn how to use this because it is super individualized. And, you know, with the power meter, it was always definite. Like a watt was a watt. Torque times RPM is going to equal the watt. But here, sometimes... One and one doesn't equal two, and you need to figure out those little nuances. And um, that, that's, that's the beauty of this entire 
platform. Yeah, that's straight to my point is it helps in that refining process. Because if you have visibility on the athletes fueling throughout the duration of a thing, you can then go back and just like somebody doing a time trial, for example, you can see when they burned it too hot, um, spent all their anaerobic capacity or burned too much um, glycogen and went too anaerobic, then you bring that down in order to finish stronger next time of sorts to make it simplistic. And so I think this, this, what you, with prescribe, what you said there is just like, you need analyze, prescribe, refine, and then repeat. And I think this tool really, really does that well. A hundred percent. Yeah. Fede, I want to talk a little bit about the coaching dashboard, um, just a bit. And, and, and for our listeners, this is not a, tool that I recommend for anybody listening, nor is it going to be available anytime soon. It may even change names, but Fede, can you talk a little bit more about how we could extrapolate these blood glucose uh, levels over a long period of time to see better trends and, and help in that refining process? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the concept of being able to overlay uh, glucose data with other variables started um, when when I when I was working in Team Novo, uh, where we needed uh, the ability to actually visualize uh, the glucose fluctuations with respect to uh, power, for example, during a ride or heart rate or elevation uh, or distance um, or whatever kind of variable you do collect on the bike. Uh, and then we started also looking at 24 hours data to have a better um, understanding on what is the relationship between a certain training session to our kind of glucose control or our athletes glucose control. And from there, we bridge the, uh, the knowledge into, uh, into here, into super sapiens, giving athletes or coaches actually the possibility to monitor their athletes longitudinally, uh, remotely uh, over time. Uh, first of all, to start learning uh, how your kind of prescription, whether it's a training uh, or whether it's a nutrition schedule or whether it's recovery, it, it is affecting your athlete performance but also uh, to let the athletes know knows that you are in control as as your as their coach because you want to monitor them you want to kind of create this education layer behind talking with your athletes on glucose fluctuations over time and also to inform action so how do you change behavior if you don't have visibility over your athletes data and so the the coaches dashboard is uh, the attempt to give coaches visibility uh, over glucose on their athletes for their athletes and now it's it's a it's a beta version so we are testing uh, the product out and um, coaches will be able to monitor a um, group of athletes so being able to grouping athletes into different kind of um, uh, layers uh, or groups uh, but also to integrate uh, variables like power heart rate speed elevation within the same platform that is going to be a web-based um, dashboard and you will have uh, almost live data. So at the moment, the current capacity is to visualize data with a delay of, of half an hour. So your ability is really to look into data closely with your athlete without the need to log into their app to look at their data. So you will be really in control and you will visualize events um, that athletes will create into the app uh, over the dashboard. So you will start creating association by yourself uh, you can uh, download data from there. So being able to do some more advanced analytics um, down to your own skill set. Uh, but this is uh, the next level of uh, coaching using Glucose uh, through the, the dashboard. Yeah, so it's kind of like a training peaks or today's plan for blood glucose. Yeah, that's correct. That's exactly the, the, the mission of the dashboard. Got it, got it, cool. Well, looking forward to seeing, hearing, and working more with that. Um, I know the few athletes that I have, including my own sensor, when I'm looking at the coach's dashboard, I like what I see, but I've yet to learn a, a lot more on that. So, um, but for now we'll, we'll put that one, we'll put a pin in that for, for now. Yeah, we are uh, working a lot down to simplifying the approach to investigating this new metric, this new analyte that is actually new in the context of, uh, uh, human performance monitoring. So until last year, nobody was even paying attention to 
to glucose. They, they didn't even know what glucose is, what glucose does. But now the, the knowledge is spreading and people have start, started uh, studying by themselves. And this collective kind of effort will push forward our, our, our current understanding. And, and, and as you said, it, it's going to be uh, like what happened with power meters, for example, or with heart rate. So the world is moving together through the understanding on, on how to use it. And we now have the duty to simplify the approach, to make it relevant when it's relevant, uh, and to make it adjustable when it's adjustable and, and informative when it needs to be informative. Got it. Well, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about the uniqueness or the individualized aspect of this, and I've done several episodes on the train right podcast talking about the individual po approach to training concepts, finding your own uniqueness of how you react to anaerobic training or aerobic training, uh, strengths and weaknesses and, and so on. And so we're touching on it here. And I think while human physiology is the same at some level, you know, when you drill deeper, it gets more and more unique. Brad, can you speak to that a little bit more? Because you're you're out in the field working with these athletes and you're hearing stories about how they may be changing things or or not changing things because it's working um, using these sensors that just to recap, you put a sensor on your arm, you pair it to your phone, and then you can get visibility on your phone or your training device while you're while you're going to see more insight on what blue blood glucose is doing. So I guess um to ask in a very long way, Brad, uh, what are some of the changes that you're seeing that athletes are making or changes that they may not be making because stuff is working? At first using the app, it was a little confusing because it's, it is a new metric. It is a new data point that athletes are trying to understand on, well, you know, I felt great on this, on this exercise session, but my, my glucose was a hundred, you know, and I never reached my GPZ. Well, now we've implemented this score, the glucose score, that kind of gives an athlete a metric of how they actually performed um, metabolically and fueling wise in an activity um, that goes, um, pulls in a couple metrics. Um, it would be their slope, their time in GPZ, their lows and drops. And so an athlete can really fine tune what actually happened in an activity to know like, am I actually improving? Am I implementing this data that I'm using in the next session and in the next session. And so it is analyzing the data, the refinement, and the repeating that where athletes are starting to understand, oh, this is how this data is actually enabling me to understand why I felt this way in this activity. You know, why, why I, I now have adjusted my fueling protocol in the priming where you know, I used to be panicked and I'd, and I'd, you know, before a big event, I'd slam, I'd slam a jail 30 minutes before. And, and then I kind of hang out. Well, then I would see this, this trend in my, in my glucose that it's dropping whenever I'm wanting to start my warm up or start, start the race. And so these, these insights, um, it doesn't have to be the, the huge dashboard that enables someone to really refine it down to a minute by minute. It's, it's using this app each day to make themselves better to say, you know what, yesterday, you know, I was panicked. I ate a bagel. I got dressed. I hung out. It was 30 minutes or it was 15 minutes. And my body metabolically responded with glucose up, insulin response brings it down. And, you know, I kind of had a crappy workout. And so how can I refine that? And so in that priming state, you know, they look at it in the workout, they see the glucose score, they got a, a 25. They're like, man, I got a 25, but yet my glucose, you know, in the last 30 minutes made it up to 140 doing this interval. They say, well, why did I get a 25? Why did I get a 36 score? You know, whenever I, you know, I ate, I ate food beforehand, I fueled in the activity. Well, it all comes down to the timing of it. And so these athletes taking these insights, creating behavioral changes is what the app intends, enables them to have a better time of glucose performance in this activity, in the perform. And so that's where each athlete has to take the time to actually notice, well, what did I do beforehand? And what happened in the activity? How did I feel afterwards? And so a lot of athletes are, are starting to adjust. You know, they're eating more often. They're, instead of going out with just water in their bottles, they're doing two scoops, two scoops of scratch in there every time or three or bring in the, bring in the super fuel, you know, or whatever, whatever their choice is, you know, and then they're able to see, oh, I actually had a better performance in the activity when I fueled more often. Uh, whenever I was able to, pay attention to this with the visibility of a Garmin um, linking from via Bluetooth from the app 
to the Garmin or our energy band, seeing that in real time and not waiting to say, oh, I only eat at 30 minutes. I only eat it at, at 45 minutes. And now they're ahead of the game. They're ahead of the instincts and the intuition. They're able to see this in real time. So there's never a panic reaction. There's never overfueling, thinking that this is going to prepare them to be better. And so that's where we're really seeing the changes. And the athletes are having personal best just on a general ride or a general run or in a marathon. Athletes are taking minutes off their time with this visibility that they're using in training and implement, implementing that in a goal event and seeing the improvements. And that's where we are hoping to keep evolving the app with the glucose score, with enabling more insights in priming um, and ensuring that they're paying attention to all this. Yeah, no, th 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 that's it. Um, you're really helping them change a habit for the better outcome, right? And changing yeah. habits can, changing habits can be really tough. I mean, the psychology of habit formation is, is fascinating. Uh, I think we've learned recently, I mean, it's, it's no longer, you know, 21 days, it's more like 66 in order to like make something stick in our lives. Uh, Charles Duick writes a good book about that. Um, so I think that habit forming and, and then the, the why, right? Because the athlete's not going to change a habit or do something differently because that's inefficient unless they know that it's going to have a better outcome, right? Right. And well, now they have a data point, you know, whenever you see it visibly, yeah. instead of just, oh, well, I felt this way. Oh, I, I fueled, I fueled, I couldn't have eaten any more. Well, now we have, you have the point in front of you on the Garmin or in the app, if you're on Zwift and you just pull it up and you're, and you're sitting there watching the number. You have this point that says, oh, I actually do feel better when I am able to fuel properly, reach, reach 120 milligrams per deciliter and keep it there with the proper fueling. Or, you know, it's 45 minutes left to get home on the ride. Oh, I have some food in my pocket or 30 minutes left. And they just, they see the trend of their glucose going down and down. And they're like, oh, this is what happens. And this is how this impairs the next day's workout. And so this is where these athletes are able to make these behavioral changes finish every workout in a, in a, in an endless energy state and have better goal achievement, you know, feel better, have, have better in, insights. I'm like, man, that was a great workout. And I actually fueled it. Well, go figure. Um, and so, yeah, it's exciting to see their, to see their excitement whenever they come back to us with these, with these insights. Yeah. I, I'm always willing to point out my shortcomings on this silly show too. And I'll say that throughout this process and, and, uh, learning from you all and texting with Brad and stuff, like I'm the typical, I've got around 90 minutes at lunchtime. You go out and smash on a quick group ride, come home and get back to work. And I know like you're late to it and all so water in the bottles, if you remember that. And, and so I was just going and I started wearing the sensor. I'm like, okay, well, let me just start putting that, that scratch in there. Let me start fueling a little bit better and, and try this time and zone. And I was still performing well with water. It's 90 minutes and less. I'm generally a pretty good eater, but like what I noticed is I could go, I could repeat day after day after day. And I was not crashing in the afternoon because I was fueling during. So it helped me just to, I think, perform better, be happier and be healthier in the afternoon rather than like overeat or feel puffy or just be like, you know, on the phone with an athlete. Like, yeah. Yeah. And halfway falling asleep sometimes. So <laughs> I, I would admit. actually, yeah, that, and that's true. And I would love to hear Fede's point on like how that proper fueling and activity actually yeah. helps yourself metabolically and, and cognitive wise later in the day and better glucose stability. Cause he's got a lot of info on that. He does indeed. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's uh, it's again a lot about self experimentation at this stage. Um, so, for example, we don't know enough um, between the relationship. Um, I mean, on the relationship between low glucose levels, for example, and uh, performance during exercise. But we do have a lot of uh, anecdotes and stories of people feeling symptoms of low glucose levels during exercise so there there is something that is connecting to the um, inability to perform so exercise capacity and tolerance when you are low in glucose levels and this is where the available literature is not supporting because we don't have any um, kind of formal test to understand what is this relationship, but also we don't have any epidemiological study on, on this relationship. So this is where we need to develop that 
to develop the concept, to study the concept, and to find association, if any. Um, but and this is another example uh, connected to what Brad was saying. So, what is the relationship between your fueling strategy during exercise and your feeling and recovery capacity after exercise? So, how is that affecting what is happening after afterward? Because of course, the less you fuel the exercise, the more you have to fuel after work to replenish your liver stores or your, your muscle stores. So there is for sure a relationship. We just need to better understand it. Yeah, well, um, the N of one over here loves blood glucose, especially when going hard. And it makes me, uh, makes me feel a heck of a lot better later in the day. So if anything else, Super Sapiens has helped me conquer that one. Or at least reminded yeah, me to, to practice what I'm preaching to my athletes. Yeah, and this is exactly where uh, science will get developed. I mean, most mo most of the time, science start with an observation or with a story from an athlete. And this is where you start developing a concept and then you make it a theory through investigations. So it's thanks to these feedbacks that we can develop new knowledge and we will develop new knowledge. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Bobby, I'm going to kick it to you for kind of last set of questions, because if our listeners are getting as excited as I think they are about blood glucose and they want to go out and get their sensor and get their phone going and, and train like a super sapien, uh, where can they get this? How, how does that work? Unfortunately, we are not selling over here in the U.S. yet. We sell in eight countries over in Europe. Um, where they're able to, to download the app and get, get on the sensors. Uh, we, we do have a study over here with, with a certain uh, population of people. Um, but listen, just because you can't go get the sensor, this technology, in my opinion, uh, I'll club at that by my opinion, is going to change the world. And I hope Super Sapiens is the company that does it. I, I am 100% behind that. But it's going to be here one way or another. And why not take this time before you can actually get on the sensor? We've got an amazing content in, on our website, supersapiens.com. We've got amazing ed educational pieces. Why not take this time to read up on it and see if it's for you and to learn the little nuances of the system? I mean, man, back in 1999, I wish I would have read the manual, the SRM manual, because like when I put it on, I had no idea how to use it and really just kind of wasted it for a year or two. So unfortunately, it's not available in North America yet. Um, we are strictly adhering to the FDA approval process. Uh, you may see some other companies out there that um, may not be doing the same, but we wanted to make sure that we went through that whole process 100%. Um, I wish I could give you an update as tomorrow, next month, next year, but um, I, I, I do not have an update of when it'll be available over here in the States, but uh, sooner or later it's going to be. And I think that you're going to want to know the, the basics of this before you get online. So go to our website, read all you can, absorb that content, ask questions to to, to us, to, to other people, um, you know, using the system so that you're really ahead of the game when you can purchase the sensor over here in North America. Yeah, that's, that's good. So move to Europe or be patient <laughs> guessing that most people aren't going to move to Europe. Uh, but to, to Bobby's point, I mean, the, the education is, is paramount. I think, you know, reading about why blood glucose, how the blood glucose works in your body so that you're uh, fully up to speed by the time that you'll be on sensor is, is good. Um, and can I say one more, yeah, one more thing yeah, there, yeah, kind of a, a funny story that, uh, I just, I just want to be clear that, you know, being well fueled is not going to throw 20, 30, 40 watts on your, your FTP or your functional threshold power. What we're trying to make sure of here is that fueling isn't the limiting factor. And um, funny story with Adam was, uh, what was that, a month and a half, two months ago, yeah. we were doing a gravel race, uh, the Belgian waffle ride, I believe it was. Yep. Uh, and all of a sudden, I'm going up a climb and I hear this voice behind me and basically says out of nowhere, and this is the first time I've heard it, what is your, your blood glucose levels right now? 
And I was like, I was wearing a Super Sapiens jersey and kit. So I thought it was somebody just kind of, you know, giving me a hard time. And I turned around and, and it was you, uh, Adam. And you will go down in history as being the first person that asked me that in the middle of an event. But I guarantee you won't be the last. So, the last. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it, no, and that was super fun. That was a time period where my blood glucose was optimized and I was feeling like a champ. But uh, it was only a short Three hours after that, you climbed away from me in the woods, and I was just in cramp city, hurting real bad on that last hill climb, man. Ooh. I, I wish we would have had a like a documentary series filming us during that because, man, you you were going, and yeah. I'm sitting there fueling and yeah. looking at my live visibility, knowing that, gosh, we have more than half of this to go. Yeah. And um, but sorry that you got the short end of that stick, but I'm sure you learned from it. And that's what this is all about. Oh, I got, I got the, the stick for sure. We were, so to bring some context, we were trying to get this, we had a massive group. We were trying to get them to work together, uh, but it's a gravel ride and the road tactics were not being deployed as, as we wished. Uh, however, I was like, eh, I'll do the work. I'm feeling great. Blood glucose right there. Awesome. All good. But again, go back glucose. to my blood glucose. What did I say? Glucose. Not blood glucose, glucose. <laughs> glucose. Glucose was going good. And to my habits, again, my 90 minute lunch rides with lack of volume on the weekends really caught up to me at about hour <laughs> five. Um, so, anyway, I, I, but I hit peak powers. I was going good, um, all the things. And I would say, uh, you know, thanks to the, kind of this visibility, I, I've never had a day like that before. Haven't had one since again because I haven't done something silly like that. But, um, it was uh, it was awesome, and it was good to ride with Bobby for the majority of the day. So uh, thanks for bringing that up, Bobby. Now everybody knows. <laughs> um, I guess the last question I have, Bobby, was kind of the future forward of Super Sapiens. I know you guys have inked some deals with Iron Man, and the UCI has said no go for now. A any other kind of um, little little nuggets of of future knowledge that you can share with us on this podcast um, about where you guys are headed? I'm going to check this one to Brad because he is uh, one of the head people on our ambassador team. He's out there at these events. Um, I have not yet gone to an event because I had to renew my passport and um, just got that back. So I'm ready to go. But I think Brad would be the much better person to, to answer those. More so, the biggest Brad, thing is in app <clears throat> is the in app, and it's it's the coaching in app. It's it's the it's the insights in app. It's how we're collecting this data with with the individual and kind of individualizing it and giving them those insights of like, hey, what's going on here? Like, what? Why was this spike happening? You know, how how did you actually prepare yourself for this activity in the priming? And so, it's really what we're going to be able to do in app, and then it's endless on the athletes that we're going to be able to help improve their goals and their, and their lifestyles is the biggest integration and kind of the insight that we hope to have very soon. Very cool. Very cool. Well, just to, just to recap, I mean, super sapiens is the human performance company that is showcasing, um, the use of CGM with optimizing fueling for before, which they call prime during, which they call perform. And then the recovery, uh, window thereafter to set you up for an optimal, uh, training regime over all the years to come. And, um, I, I'm just super excited about this company and I, I've, I've been able to be on sensor and, and, and kind of be a, a, a fly in the room to hear some of these bigger brains share their knowledge. And now our listeners, you all have had that opportunity as well. So I, I think, you know, I think we've stirred the pot on, on, you know, what is to come out of this company. I look forward to them getting the FDA uh, certification and being here in the U S uh, guys, I'll turn it over to you. Anything else you want to add on to this, this episode? Fede? Well, I can talk about science for another couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, it, well, I would listen to you, but uh, I know that you probably have uh, other things to do and, and get on with your day because Fede is back. He's in Europe. Um, Bobby is, is over in, in Arizona. And Brad, where? South Carolina. Oh, South Carolina. Sorry. And Green, uh, Brad, Greenville. Where Greenville. Okay. So we're spread out all over the place and, um, they were able to, Bobby's, to give in, me Bobby's in Greenville. Bobby's in Greenville. I'm in the Midwest. 
Fede's in Italy, and he's he's got a, a precious dog that probably wants to go outside for a walk right now. So, <laughs> hold on, I'm checking my blood glucose because clearly I'm lacking or glucose. something. Glucose. I'm at your glucose. What did I say? Blood glucose. It's glucose because it. Glucose. We're, t- we're oh yeah, you're you're cranking. I'm jacked ex- right now. We're excited. Hold yeah, on. real excited. So <laughs> I must that, be real look excited too. Look at that stability. One fourteen. Yeah, that is- yeah, and, and Bobby, I'll be the first one to ask you on a podcast, what's your glu- glucose? Woo! Yeah, 89. Just chilling. Chilling. Fede? Yeah. Are we... Uh, nine zero. Man. Well, I, had, I had a response. Look at that. Look you at did have stress. a response. <laughs> yeah. See, I have my own podcast, so it doesn't really spike me, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of yeah. used to it. That's true. That's very true. I did have breakfast. I, 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 will, I will say that. I had a late breakfast, you guys. But yeah, Mr. Podcast, like fatigue resistance there in, in the middle of my screen and you two lumberjacks on the side. Man, I'm telling you, I got lots to learn, lots to learn. <laughs> Well, if there's if there's uh, nothing else, guys, uh, I really again I want to thank you for taking time um, out of your busy days. Thank you, Fede, Bobby, Brad. Um, I've learned a lot on this episode, and I think our listeners have too. Uh, and we look forward to getting everybody in the world on sensors soon. Love it. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam, Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thanks, guys.